All right, good evening, everyone. And tonight we're gonna to be talking about chapter eight, uh, memory in the psychology second edition uh, textbook. Um, and just to let you guys know, when I play videos, sometimes there's some copyright issues and I have to trim the videos out. So if you're viewing uh, this lecture at a later date, um, you may see that where the video started, it gets cut and then the lecture will pick up after the video um, if there was a copyright issue. So I just kind of want to let everyone know that that sometimes happens. Um, all videos are uh, posted also in, um, uh, in Canvas so that uh, if there is uh, a cut or a trimming that I need to do in my video lectures, then you still have access to the video that we were discussing if you wanna review it. Sometimes students like to, like to do that. And then there are certain videos that I recommend people review if they need to before exams, because sometimes there's some really helpful information on there. All right, so let's get started. So what we're gonna talk about first um, is basically how memory functions and, and what, is, what is memory, right? And um, so, very simply, memory is the set of processes that we use in order to en encode, store, and retrieve information um, over different periods of time, right? So uh, tonight, you know, as you are participating in this lecture and watching the videos later on and then participating in our discussions, um, you know, you're gonna be receiving sensory information, you know, gonna be seeing things, hearing things, uh, you're reading things right now. And what's happening right now is this is the beginning of that process where it goes into encoding, right? Um, hopefully, then it will move into storage. And then when it comes time for the exam, um, there's retrieval, right? And that's your ability to uh, get the information back out of your memory and into your awareness so that you can answer the question uh, correctly on the exam. All right, so the next uh, thing, actually, I, like I said earlier, I want to start off with, um, with a video, and this is um, Elizabeth Loftus. It runs about 17 minutes, so it's a little bit long. That's kind of why I wanted to put it toward the front, and we will be talking about different aspects of this video later on in the lecture. Um, and so, uh, so I'm gonna start it here in just a second, but just remember if it gets trimmed out, that's because uh, YouTube would not allow me to keep it in my video lecture. So, all right, so let's go ahead and watch this and then we'll come back together after the video. I'd like to tell you uh, about a legal case that I worked on involving a man named Steve Titus. Titus was a restaurant manager. He was 31 years old. He lived in Seattle, Washington. He was engaged to Gretchen, about to be married. She was the love of his life. And one night, the couple went out for a romantic restaurant meal. They were on their way home, and they were pulled over by a police officer. You see, Titus's car sort of resembled a car that was driven earlier in the evening by a man who raped a female hitchhiker. And Titus kind of resembled uh, that rapist. So the police took a picture of Titus. They put it in a photo lineup. They later showed it to the victim. And she pointed to Titus's photo. She said, that one's the closest. The police and the prosecution proceeded with a trial. And when Steve Titus was put on trial for rape, the rape victim got on the stand and said, I'm absolutely positive that's the man. And Titus was convicted. He proclaimed his innocence. His family screamed at the jury. His fiance collapsed on the floor sobbing, and Titus is taken away to jail. So what would you do at this point? What would you do? Well, Titus lost complete faith in the legal system. 
And yet he got an idea. He called up the local newspaper. He got the interest of an investigative journalist. And that journalist actually found the real rapist, a man who ultimately confessed to this rape, a man who was thought to have committed 50 rapes in that area. And when this information was given to the judge, the judge set Titus free. And really, that, that's where this case sh should have ended. It should have been over. Titus should have thought of this as a horrible year, a year of accusation and trial, but over. It didn't end that way. Titus was so bitter, he'd lost his job, he couldn't get it back. He lost his fiance, she couldn't put up with his persistent anger. He lost his entire savings, and so he decided to file a lawsuit against the police and others whom he felt were responsible for his suffering. And, and that's when I really started working on this case, trying to figure out how did that victim go from that one's the closest to I'm absolutely positive that's the guy. Well, Titus was consumed with his civil case as he spent every waking moment thinking about it. And just days before he was to have his day in court, he woke up in the morning, doubled over in pain, and died of a stress-related heart attack. He was 35 years old. So I was asked to work on Titus's case because I'm a psychological scientist, I study memory, I've studied memory for decades. And if, if I meet somebody on an airplane, this happened on the way over to Scotland, if I meet somebody on an airplane and we ask each other, what do you do, what do you do? And I say, I study memory. They usually want to tell me how they have trouble remembering names or they've got a, a relative who's got Alzheimer's or some kind of memory uh, problem. But, but I have to tell them, I don't study when people forget. I study the opposite, when they remember. When they remember things that didn't happen or remember things that were different from the way they really were. I study false memories. Unhappily, Steve Titus is not the only person to be convicted based on somebody's false memory. In one project in the United States, information has been gathered on 300 innocent people, 300 defendants who were convicted of crimes they didn't do. They spent 10, 20, 30 years in prison for these crimes, and now DNA testing has proven that they're actually innocent. And when those cases have been analyzed, three quarters of them are due to faulty memory, faulty eyewitness memory. Well, why? Like the jurors who convicted those innocent people and the jurors who convicted Titus, many people believe that, that memory works like a recording device. You just record the information, then you call it up and play it back when you want to answer questions or identify images. But decades of work in psychology has shown that this just isn't true. Our memories are constructive. They're reconstructive. Memory works a little bit more like a Wikipedia page. You can go in there and change it, but so can other people. <laughs> I first started studying this constructive memory process in the 1970s. I did my experiments that involved showing people simulated crimes and accidents and asking them questions about what they remember. In one study, we showed people a simulated accident, and we asked people how fast were the cars going when they hit each other. And we asked other people how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other. And if we asked the leading smash question, the witnesses told us the cars were going faster. And moreover, that leading smashed question caused people to be more likely to tell us that they saw broken glass in the accident scene when there wasn't any broken glass at all. In another study, we showed a simulated accident where a car went through an intersection with a stop sign. And if we asked a question that insinuated it was a yield sign, many witnesses told us they remember seeing a yield sign at the intersection, not a stop sign. 
And you might be thinking, well, you know, these are filmed events. They're not particularly stressful. Would the same kind of mistakes be made with a really stressful event? In a study we published just a few months ago, we have an answer to this question. Because what was unusual about this study is we arranged for people to have a very stressful experience. The subjects in this study were members of the US military who were undergoing a, a harrowing training exercise to teach them what it's going to be like for them if they are ever captured as prisoners of war. And as part of this training exercise, these soldiers are interrogated in an aggressive, hostile, physically abusive fashion for 30 minutes. And later on, they have to try to identify the person who conducted that interrogation. And when we feed them suggestive information that insinuates it's a different person, many of them misidentify their interrogator, often identifying someone who doesn't even remotely resemble the real interrogator. And so what these studies are showing is that when you feed people misinformation about some experience that, that they may have had, you can distort or contaminate or change their memory. Well, out there in the real world, misinformation is everywhere. We get misinformation not only if we're questioned in a leading way, but if we talk to other witnesses who might consciously or inadvertently feed us some erroneous information, or if we see uh, media coverage about some event we might have experienced, all of these provide the opportunity for this kind of contamination of our memory. In the 1990s, we began to see an even more extreme kind of memory problem. Some patients were going into therapy with one problem, maybe they had depression, eating disorder, and they were coming out of therapy with a different problem. Extreme memories for horrific brutalization, sometimes in satanic rituals, sometimes involving really bizarre and unusual elements. One woman came out of psychotherapy believing that she'd endured years of ritualistic abuse where she was forced into a pregnancy and that the baby was cut from her belly. But there were no physical scars or any kind of physical evidence that could have supported her story. And when I began looking into these cases, I was wondering, where do these bizarre memories come from? And what I found is that most of these situations involved some particular form of psychotherapy. And so I asked, were some of the things going on in this psychotherapy, like the imagination exercises, or dream interpretation, or in some cases hypnosis, or in some cases exposure to false information, were these leading these patients to develop these very bizarre, unlikely memories. And I designed some experiments to try to study the processes that were being used in this psychotherapy so I could study the development of these very rich false memories. In one of the first studies we did, we used suggestion a method inspired by the psychotherapy we saw in these cases. We used this kind of suggestion and planted a false memory that when you were a kid, five or six years old, you were lost in a shopping mall. You were frightened, you were crying, you were ultimately rescued by an elderly person and reunited with the family. And we succeeded in planting this memory in the minds of about a quarter of our subjects. And, and you might be thinking, well, that's not particularly stressful. But we and other investigators have planted rich false memories of things that were much more unusual and much more stressful. So in a study done in Tennessee, researchers planted the false memory that when you were a kid, you nearly drowned and had to be rescued by a lifeguard. And in a study done in Canada, researchers planted the false memory that when you were a kid, something as awful as being attacked by a vicious animal happened to you, succeeding with about half of their subjects. And in a study done in Italy, researchers planted the false memory, when you were a kid, you witnessed 
demonic possession. I do want to add that it might seem like we are traumatizing these experimental subjects in the name of science, but our studies have gone through thorough evaluation by research ethics boards that have made the decision uh, that the temporary discomfort that some of these subjects might experience in these studies is outweighed by the importance of this problem for understanding memory processes and the abuse of memory that is going on in some places in the world. Well, to my surprise, when I published this work and began to speak out against this particular brand of psychotherapy, it created some pretty bad problems for me. Hostilities primarily from the repressed memory therapists who felt under attack and by the patients whom they had influenced. I had sometimes armed guards at speeches that I was invited to give, people trying to drum up letter writing campaigns to get me fired. But probably the worst was I suspected that a woman was innocent of abuse that was being claimed by her grown daughter. She accused her mother uh, of sexual abuse based on a repressed memory. And this accusing daughter had actually allowed her story to be filmed and presented in public places. I was suspicious of this story, and so I started to investigate and eventually found information that convinced me that this mother was innocent. I published an expose on the case, and a little while later, the accusing daughter filed a lawsuit. Even though I'd never mentioned her name, she sued me for defamation and invasion of privacy. And I went through nearly five years of dealing with this messy, uh, un um, unpleasant uh, litigation. But, but finally, finally, it was over, and I could really uh, get back uh, to my work. In the process, however, I became part of a disturbing trend in America where scientists are being sued for simply speaking out on matters of great public controversy. When I got back to my work, I asked this question. If I plant a false memory in your mind, does it have repercussions? Does it affect your later thoughts, your later behaviors? Our first study planted a false memory that you got sick as a child, eating certain foods, hard-boiled eggs, dill pickles, strawberry ice cream. And we found that once we planted this false memory, people didn't want to eat the foods as much at an outdoor picnic. The false memories aren't necessarily bad or unpleasant. If we planted a warm, fuzzy memory involving a healthy food like asparagus, we could get people to want to eat asparagus more. And so what these studies are showing is that you can plant false memories and they have repercussions that affect behavior long after the memories take hold. Well, along with this ability to plant memories and control behavior, obviously comes some important ethical issues. Like when should we use this mind technology and should we ever ban its use? Therapists can't ethically plant false memories in the mind of their patients, even if it would help the patient. But there's nothing to stop a parent from trying this out on their overweight or obese teenager. And when I suggested this publicly, it created outcry again. There she goes. She's advocating that parents lie to their children. Hello, Santa Claus. <laughs> I mean, I, I, another way to... to to, well, another way to think about this is, which would you rather have? A kid with obesity, diabetes, shortened lifespan, all the things that go with it, or a kid with one little extra bit of false memory? I, I know what I would choose for a kid of mine. But maybe my work has made me different from most people. Most people cherish their memories, know that they represent their identity, who they are, where they came from. And I appreciate that. I feel that way, too. But I know from my work how much fiction is already in there. If I've learned anything from these decades of working on these problems, it's this. 
Just because somebody tells you something and they say it with confidence, just because they say it with lots of detail, just because they express emotion when they say it, it doesn't mean that it really happened. We can't reliably distinguish true memories from false memories. We need independent corroboration. Such a discovery has made me more tolerant of the everyday memory mistakes that my friends and family members make. Such a discovery might have saved Steve Titus, the man whose whole future was snatched away by a false memory. But meanwhile, we should all keep in mind, we do well to, that memory, like liberty, is a fragile thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, <clears throat> so um, so she talked about a lot of different things that we're actually going to be uh, exploring over the next several slides and throughout the rest of this. And one of the things that she brought up um, that I want you guys to kind of um, uh, remember is that memory is uh, both constructive and reconstructive. And and, and basically what that means is, is memory is not like a videotape. And I believe she even said that. There's, a, there's another video later on that's gonna kind of say the same thing. Um, our memories, we don't like video our, our, our experiences. Um, they get encoded and it's different sensory information and, our, and, and things get constructed. Um, when we're retrieving information, when we're recalling memories, right? Um, that's where things can be reconstructed. And this is where uh, the risk of contamination and all the different things that, that she um, talked about that she's been studying over the years um, come into play, right? Um, and so what we're going to do is, is we're going to move into, um, uh, into, into the uh, building blocks, right? So right now we're going to start with encoding. And when it comes to encoding, um, right now you're receiving information. You're hearing my voice. You just watched a video. You're reading this stuff on, on the screen. When the brain receives information from the environment, it labels it, it codes it. Um, it organizes it with other similar information. You know, our brains are amazing in that way. Um, and there are two, two types of encoding that occur. And, and yes, I do want you to remember these, right? So one is automatic pros processing. And this is the encoding of details like time, space, frequency. Um, you're, you're going through automatic processing now as you're listening to my words, right? What are the meanings of the words? Um, this is usually done really without conscious awareness. Yes, you're conscious, you're listening to me, um, but you're not thinking about Oh, right now I'm automatically processing Richard's words, <laughs> right? This is, this is not, not what you're, um, it's not how you're doing it, right? So automatic processing occurs with all of these. Um, and then effortful processing is encoding of details or information um, that take time and effort, right? So in the two examples, that are, are here, right, is when was the last time you studied, right? So remembering when the last time you studied, it's part of that automatic processing um, uh, encoding. What you studied, right? What was it that you focused on when you were studying, learning your new skills or new information on memory or the last chapter until, um, um, intelligence? Um, what you studied requires effortful processing. So in other words, you are, you are deliberately making these um, conscious efforts to uh, learn new information. The other example here is when you first learn new skills such as driving a car, you're gonna put forth um, effort, time, attention to that, right? 
to encode the information about your driving. But once you know how to drive, right, you can encode um, additional information about this skill automatically, right? So, it, so once you have those basics down and you've been doing it for a while, any new information almost be, is, is effortless, if that makes sense. All right. So then there are types of encoding, right? So we, uh, so let me just back up because sometimes I like to make sure we're not confusing, right? So there are two types of processing that occurs with encoding. And then there are three types of encoding that I want to focus on, right? So there's semantic encoding. Again, that's what you're doing right now is you're hearing my words. Right, um, it's encoding words and their meanings. Um, then there's visual encoding, which you did when you were watching the video. You're doing it as you're reading the information on the screen. Maybe you're jotting down notes, um, and and so you're 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 encoding what you're seeing, right? Um, and then there's acoustic encoding, which is the encoding of sounds. And then one other aspect I wanna kind of hit on real quick is the self-reference effect, right? And this is the tendency for an individual to have a better memory for information that relates to oneself, right? It's all about me, 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 me. <laughs> um, in comparison to material that has a less personal um, relevance. And next, I want to talk about storage, right? And so storage is the creation of the permanent record of information, right? And if we look at the um, atkinson schifrin model of memory, um, you'll see that, that memory actually passes through three distinct stages for it to make it to be stored into long-term memory, right? And this is based on the belief that memories are processed in the same way that a computer processes information. And actually, you know, when you did your reading in the book, um, that example is um, threaded throughout, uh, throughout the text in, in that part, right? Where it talks about um, encoding and entering it on the keyboard and retrieval, and you're seeing it on the computer screen, uh, things like that. So that's, that's the example that the book uses. Uh, so you see here, uh, and this is from the book as well. So we have sensory input, right? And that sensory input goes into the, into the first part, right? Which is the sensory memory. And any information here that doesn't get transferred uh, into short-term memory um, at this point gets lost, right? So we're bombarded with information all day long. We don't, we don't store every single thing, right? Uh, just be, it would be too much. So information that's not, that's not stored may not be relevant, right? Um, we don't keep it. Sensory information that is kept and moves into short-term memory, um, this is where uh, rehearsal will come in. Like if you're trying to uh, remember a phone number, for example, so you get, and we'll, we'll talk about, <laughs> about that in a second too, where studies show that in short-term memory, we can hold on to about seven items, right? Um, and if you want to, somebody's giving you their phone number and you don't have a piece of paper to write it on, um, you might go, you know, um, 8675309, right? Um, and for you older people here, you'll know where that, that comes from. <laughs> That's Jenny's phone number. Um, but you might say that over and over and over again. Um, and any information at this point that is not uh, transferred gets lost. But with rehearsal, it now has an opportunity to go into long-term memory. Uh, and then you'll notice when it comes to short-term memory and long-term memory, you'll see that there's two arrows going back and forth, right? So that information uh, uh, can go bilaterally there. Anybody remember? Uh, Jenny, Jenny, let's see. Yes, and somebody was 
uh, saying I used to do that when uh, my mom would send me to buy groceries to the market when I was young. Right, exactly. Right. So you got this short little list and you're trying to remember it. Um, yeah. And so you just kind of use rehearsal. Good example. And let's talk about sensory memory. Um, so sensory memory is a storage of brief sensory um, events such as sights, sounds, and tastes, right? And so this stuff gets stored for like a couple of seconds. So if you've ever had the experience, for instance, of uh, like an acoustic sensory memory, right? The wait what effect, right? So you're not like really paying attention. Somebody says something to you, um, you don't catch it, but it's still there. And you go, wait, what? You know, this would be an example of it being stored for a couple of seconds. If you don't have that wait, what moment, guess what happens to it? It goes away, it gets lost. Um, so in the first step of processing stimuli, this is the first step of processing stimuli from the environment, right? That, that sensory memory, that sensory input. Um, and as I said earlier, when I was on the previous slide, if the information is unimportant, you don't need it, you're not going to use it, um, it's going to be discarded. You just, you're just not going to keep it. If the, mem if the information is valuable, it's caught your attention in some way, um, and, and you want to keep, on to keep it, it's going to be moving into your short-term memory. It can still be lost at this point um, as well, though. Just be aware of that. And so short-term memory is also known as working memory. So if I, if I, um, if I say working memory or short-term short -term memory, just know that they're synonymous. They're interchangeable. Um, generally, I try to stick to the short-term memory because that's what the book pretty much talks about and that's what everybody talks about. But um, if you hear working memory, we're talking about the same thing. And so working memory or short-term memory you know, is temporary storage that um, is used to process, you know, that incoming sensory memory. And it lasts about 20 seconds. Um, and as I stated earlier, its capacity is usually about seven items, plus or minus two. And short-term memories are then either discarded or then they, or they get stored into um, long-term memory. And uh, of course I have uh, Dory here who, uh, if anybody ever saw the Finding Nemo, right? Uh, Dory was, Dory had problem with short-term memory. <laughs> memory consolidation is the transfer of short-term memory into long-term memory. Um, and then one of the ways that that can be done, we talked about that in the previous slide as well, is, is through rehearsal, right? 8675309, 8675309. Right, um, repeating it over and over and over again. Um, and I'll be honest, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, it's also in the book, that the fact that uh, 8675309 is also put to a tune makes it easier for us to remember um, as well. So a question has come up in the chat. Um, what happens to people that have traumas due to an accident, uh, like the need to start to read, speech, and that's a very good question. We will be addressing that uh, a little bit later on. We're gonna talk about the case of HM. There's also a video in, um, uh, in Canvas that you can watch. I'm not gonna have time to show HM tonight, um, but he actually had both of his temporal lobes removed, um, which impacted, an, um, uh, I believe, partial removal of his hippocampus. Um, which prevented him from learning or remembering anything new. So he could not form any new memories. Um, and so sometimes when different parts of the brain are damaged, it can impact uh, the way people um, can encode or store or consolidate memories um, or retrieve memories, right? So it's a good question and we'll, if it doesn't get ans uh, totally answered by the end of this lecture, just shoot the question up again um, and we'll see. But I think you'll, you'll see that the, uh, 
question will your question will be answered. Um, and I think I said rehearsal was the conscious repetition of information to be remembered. And I did talk about that on the previous screen. All right, so let's talk about long term memory. Now, this is one of those slides I, I, I took this picture from the book. Um, and as you can see, I'm going to turn on my uh, laser pointer. So we have long term memory right here at the top. And then long term memory is divided into two uh, different types of memory. So there's explicit memories uh, and then implicit memories. And we're going to be talking about those. Um, so under explicit memory, there's episodic memory, which is events that you have experienced, right? Um, coming to class, you know, watching these videos, that, that kind of stuff. Then there's a semantic memory, which is uh, uh, knowledge and concepts. This is kind of stuff that you're, you're learning now, right? Um, and then under implicit uh, memory, we have procedural memory, like driving a car, playing a piano. I, I'm just giving these as some examples. And, and this is um, your memory of procedures and skills, right? Um, and then there is emotional conditioning. And if you'll, heart, if you'll recall, and we'll talk about this again in another slide coming up, um, who remembers um, an example of emotional conditioning that we have already talked about this semester? Let's see if anybody remembers. Type it in the study of Little Albert? Yes, perfect example, yep. That's exactly right. And so, um, and so I'm gonna use little Albert as an example uh, in a couple of slides. But so when you think of emotional conditioning, um, he is one example of that. All right. Uh, the other thing about um, long-term memory is that it has no limit uh, and is like the information you store on a hard drive of, of a computer. Our brains can store a lot of information, a lot. All right, so I uh, um, kind of went over, well, just hold on one second. So I want you to be thinking of, of this um, diagram and we're gonna go into this a little bit deeper here. Um, so, I actually kind of said this already as I was discussing it, but um, bears repeating. So explicit memory, also known as declarative memory. Um, these are memories of facts and events that we uh, can consciously recall um, and declare. That's why it's called declarative memory. And under explicit, again, um, going back to that chart, um, semantic is knowledge of words, concepts, and language. Um, so if you know who the president is right now, that is semantic memory. Uh, if you know who your uh, who the best professor on City College is, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, not me. Uh, then, then that's semantic memory, right? And examples of episodic memory would be like remembering your birthday party when you were five years old or your um, quinceanera or um, your wedding day, right? Um, those kinds of things. And, and that's basically the what, where, and when of an event, right? Um, it's also called autobiograph uh, autobiographical memory. And there are small number of people, including actress, um, Mary Lou Henner, who have a highly superior autobi um, autobiographical memory um, known as hypermyesia. So um, I believe there is a question on the exam regarding that. So you wanna remember that as well. Um, just out of curiosity, little side note, since I had you guys do the, um, the uh, Sheldon Shaping Penny, which I forgot I wanted to talk about at the beginning of class. 
So we, we will talk about that. Um, it looks like toward the end of class. Uh, my apologies for forgetting about that because I did want to review it. Um, what kind of memory does Sheldon have if there's any Big Bang Theory um, fans here? It's not a graphic? Uh, no, no, but kind of kind of like that, but not exactly that. Yeah. Oh, wait, Let's see if we, the answer came in the chat. Uh, not semantic. Um, it's, it's called an eidetic memory. And he is one, in, of course, he's a fictional character, but the theory behind that uh, is, is they remember every single detail. They can tell you who was said what, who was doing what. Um, if you've ever watched the show, you'll, you'll see him uh, do examples of that, right? So anyway, just a little um, trivia. You won't need to know that for the exam. All right, so now we're looking at implicit memories. And with implicit memories, these are not memories that are part of our consciousness, right? And they're formed through, um, through our behaviors, through behaviors. And then there are procedural um, memory, right? Which stores information about how to do things, how to ride a bike, tie your shoes, like, um, uh, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. <clears throat> Drive a car. Um, and here's where the thing about implicit memories, and this is where I want you to uh, remember little Albert, right? So implicit memory also includes behaviors that are learned through emotional conditioning, right? So the example that I have here is you might have a fear of spiders, but not consciously remember why or what occurred to condition that fear. And when we talked about little Albert, if you'll recall, that was one of the things that I pointed out um, uh, during our discussion was that, you know, little Albert growing up to become big Albert might still fear little white fuzzy rats or, or fuzzy things, um, though he probably would not specifically remember the experiment itself, right? Um, he just knows that he is afraid of small little white fuzzy things. All right, so let's talk about how we get information back out of storage, back out of our memory, right? What are you gonna do next week, right? So remember the exam is gonna open up on Monday. Uh, by the way, I will be posting in a, uh, an exam study guide on Saturday, like I did last time. Um, and uh, so you'll be using retrieval um, to take the exam, for example, right? So retrieval is the act of getting information out of storage and back into your conscious awareness. And there are three ways to retrieve information. First of all, there's recall, um, and that's being able to access the information without cues. So this would be an example of like an essay, like if I had you write an essay on the exam, or if I had you write short answer. Um, well, no, essay is, is purely that. Um, recognition, being able to identify uh, information that you previously used after in, encountering it again, right? So when I'm doing my exams, I'm actually relying on your recognition retrieval, right? Um, and then there's relearning and that's learning information that you have previously learned, right? So after learning high school or Spanish in high school, you might forget how to speak it if you don't use it. It's kind of like one of those things, um, uh, you lose it if you don't use it, right? Um, however, if you try to relearn it, uh, because that information is still there, uh, somewhere, right? Um, you will learn it quicker than you did the first time. So that's the relearning retrieval. All right, so before we move into um, 
you know, parts of the brain involved in, uh, in memory. Is there any questions on retrieval, implicit memories, explicit memory, um, long-term memory in general? Any, any questions on the section we just covered? All right. All right. So let's talk about uh, the parts of the brain um, that's involved in memory. And the, and the first thing I want to talk about, and the book talks about this, is, um, you know, Carl Lashley's uh, theory. He believed that there was, uh, well, he was looking for evidence of an engram, right? And um, what he believed was that there was a group of neurons that basically served as the physical representation of memory. And so what he did was is he studied parts of the brain involving memory by making lesions in the brains of animals such as monkeys and rats. Uh, and remember that, you know, we learn a lot about function, unfortunately, through damage to, to those areas, right? Um, so he trained rats to learn their way around a maze. And then once they had learned the ways uh, around the, uh, the memory, what he did was he created lesions to try to remove the memory, right? Um, so he did all this work, but in the end, he was never able to find any evidence of an engram. Um, and it's funny, you still hear the word engram, en engrams, like on TV or sci-fi shows, you'll, you'll hear those words, um, but there, there really isn't any, any real evidence of that. He wasn't able to find it, right? Um, and that the rats were still able to find their way around the maze. Um, and based on this research, he formulated a new hypothesis, which is called the um, equipotentiality hypothesis. And basically what that is, is that if one area of the brain involved in memory is damaged, then another part of the same area can take over that memory function which does go along with um, when we talked in uh, chapter three, um, biopsychology, when we talked about neuroplasticity, um, this kind of falls into the neuroplasticity um, role. And then there's Eric Kandel and he studied uh, the synapse, right? So remember it's called the synapse or the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft, right? Um, remember those, those are all synonymous with each other. You know, hear him called different things. Um, but he studied the synapse and its role in controlling the flow of information through the neurocircuits that were needed to store more memory. So that's what he was studying. So let's talk about the different parts of the brain. And we are going to uh, get a little bit deeper into these um, over the next couple of slides. First, there's the cerebellum. Um, and what's interesting about the cerebellum was it used to be thought um, a while uh, back in the day, we've learned a lot more since, that the cerebellum was really, you know, um, not so much memory and stuff, but balance and, 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 and movement and other, other kinds of things. Then there's the hippocampus um, and then the amygdala, which is, uh, adjacent to the, uh, to the hippocampus, and then the prefrontal cortex, right? So all of these areas have been identified as being involved in uh, memory. So let's talk about those uh, parts a little bit deeper, right? So we have the amygdala, and the amygdala is involved in fear, fear memory, um, and then memory uh, storage is actually impacted by stress info. Uh, sorry, I misspoke. Stress hormones, right? So the amygdala processes emotional information that's important uh, in encoding memories at a deeper level. Uh, so the more, um, uh, the greater the emotional impact of an event or a situation, uh, the deeper or the more permanent that memory is going to be. Uh, and the hippocampus is associated with explicit memory, 
uh, recognition memory and spatial memory. And what it does is it projects information to cortical regions that give, uh, give your memories um, meaning and connect them with other memories. And the hippocampus is also involved with uh, memory uh, consolidation. And um, I briefly talked about HM a little bit ago. Normally I play the video at this point, but um, I wanna make sure I get some of the other videos. This video is available um, in Canvas, so you can watch it. But it's basically a video of him at home and he keeps a diary and he wakes up and he writes, he writes in his diary. Uh, and then, you know, an hour later, he's like, I didn't write that. That's not me. I didn't do that. But it's his handwriting. The video itself kind of shows him, he experiences frustration and anger. Um, can you imagine not being able to remember what you did 5, 10, 15, 60 minutes ago? Um, and, you know. So he experiences a lot of frustration, but he plays the piano beautifully. So he is, so whereas he can't form new memories, his procedural memory was not impacted. Um, you know, so uh, it's his, his uh, declarative memory that um, has been significantly uh, reduced. Wow, so to basically almost nothing. Um, so, all right, so the cerebellum um, plays a role in processing procedural memories, uh, such as how to play the piano. So if I'm uh, referring back to HM, right? So his temporal lobes, let's just go back here for a second so I can show you the, the brain again, right? So this is actually a cutaway. We're looking at um, on the inside between the um, left and right hemisphere. But if, if we were looking at the um, left side of the brain, which has been removed here, the temporal lobe would be in this area. You can actually see the bottom of the temporal area lobe on the right side right here. So basically this was removed um, and uh, this temporal lobe was removed, but his cerebellum was not impacted, right? So um, he, he wasn't able to form new memories, but his procedural memory, right, uh, because the cerebellum was still intact, was still pre pre uh, present. Right? He was still able to do that. Let's go back. So, um, so that's that's why I wanted to show you that. So the cerebellum um, plays a significant role in um, procedural memories, and then the prefrontal cortex. Um, is involved in remembering semantic tasks. And, um, you know, PET scans show activation in the left interior prefrontal cortex when completing semantic tasks. Uh, encoding is also uh, associated with left frontal activity. Uh, and then retrieval information is associated with the right frontal region. So just some different parts of the brain there. Oops. Oh, hold on, I messed up. All right, let me uh, back up, there we go, back up again. Sorry about that, okay. I wanted to do this slide. Um, so let's talk about some neurotransmitters, right? Um, and remember communication among neurons via neurotransmitters um, is known as neurotransmission, right? And that's critical for developing new memories. So you need neurotransmission for that. So repeated neural activity, increasing uh, neurotransmitters in the synaptic gap um, creates stronger connections. And that this is how uh, memory consolidation occurs, right? So it's that repeated activity, um, and those stronger connections. So neurotransmitters that are involved in memory are um, uh, epinephrine, dopamine, um, which is interesting, isn't it, right? Uh, the happy neurotransmitter, serotonin, glutamate, and acetylcholine 
all of these are um, necessary for memory. And then thinking back to the amygdala again, right? Allows uh, the arousal theory, uh, and I did briefly talk about this, um, but I didn't call it arousal theory at that point. So remember the amygdala um, manages those strong emotions, those fear responses, right? So with arousal theory, strong emotions trigger the formation of strong memories and weaker emotional uh, experiences form weaker memories. So, um, so strong emotional uh, experiences trigger the release of neurotransmitters. So if we go back up here, remember repeated neural um, activity, increasing neurotransmitters in the synapse, right? So if you're having a strong emotional response, you're gonna have significant neurotransmission. Um, an example of that would be a uh, flashbulb memory, right? So, uh, and we're gonna talk about flashbulb memory later, but an example of that would be knowing where you were when, uh, when the uh, Twin Towers were attacked or knowing where you were when Kennedy was assassinated or knowing where you were when the space shuttle Challenger um, exploded on, on takeoff. Those, those are ex examples of flashbulb memories. All right, so I'm going to play this video. And um, again, remember, um, this may end up getting cut out. Um, and then after the video, we're going to take a break. Sorry, hold on one second. Go back one. When my laser pointer is on, my mouse does not want to work correctly. So turn off my laser pointer. All right, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> We are going to take a break now um, and come back at uh, 7.20. Well, make it 7.25 because I like to give you guys at least 20 minutes. So come back at 7.25 and we will pick this up. It will give me an opportunity to fix my problem. All right, so I'm gonna play this video now. This was actually uh, done in, um, I believe, New Zealand, if my memory uh, serves me correctly. And um, if you recall from the first video today, you know, Elizabeth Lofton talked about how false memory um, experiments have been replicated in many different places. And this is a short video um, on that, that is, uh, goes, kind of deep into their experiment and what they did, which I uh, think is very interesting and I hope that you do as well. Also remember that when I upload this as the video lecture, if there's any copyright issues, which I don't think there will be, but if there are, this will actually be cut out of the video, um, but it is available on Canvas. So uh, here we go. It's a hot summer's day. You're eight years old and you're excited. It's the first time you've been up in a hot air balloon. You can see fields below. You feel the heat of the flame. It's something you'll never forget, a memory to last a lifetime. It's certainly not something you'd think you'd done if it had never happened. Psychologists at Victoria University in Wellington are finding out just how easy it is to implant false memories using digitally altered photographs. There's nothing sinister about what they're trying to do. They're just trying to get to the bottom of how memory works. It's the first time anyone's investigated the power that digital technology has to change what we remember. And the results are remarkable. It seems like the stuff of science fiction. 
30 students are shown pictures of their childhood in a study they believe is about how we reminisce. In fact, it's testing how vulnerable their memories are. This is Jessica. It's day one of the experiment. When she's first shown the fake photo of her hot air balloon ride, unsurprisingly, she has no memory of it. Tell me everything you can recall about that event. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the week, she believes she's been in a hot air balloon, but the psychologist knows it's something she's never done. I think we're all done. I'm, I'm faithful. In fact, she's being deliberately tricked. What we've been doing is uh, showing people a selection of photographs from their childhood. Four photographs. Three of them are true, and one of them is fake. So the third photograph in the booklet always depicts a subject and another family member taking a hot air balloon ride. But they've never actually been on that ride? No, no, we know that for a fact. We interview them three times over the course of a week, and by the time they get to the third interview, just a week later, half of them, 50% of our sample, believes they've been on a hot air balloon ride. 50% is much higher than Marianne Gary and her team ever expected. Even the students that don't remember the hot air balloon ride believe the photos are real. We ask family members to give us a photo of the subject that shows the subject clearly from the waist up and hopefully standing next to another family member. So we get a photograph that looks something like this. And we remove everything around that we don't want. We just grab them here and copy them over and suddenly they're in the picture. A bit big at the moment, aren't they? They won't quite fit in the hot air balloon. They're a bit big, so we have to transform them, make them smaller, and make them fit. So we end up with something like that. That looks fantastic. They really look like they're in there. Over the course of the week, subjects are asked not to speak to their family about the study. Kim asks them to think about the photos every night. By the third interview, their imaginations are starting to fill in the detail. Picture myself walking onto the balloon as if I was actually there, um, and I end up getting a picture of some kind of platform. I remember looking up at the gas and the balloon proper, so I just sort of remember stuff like that, and also looking down at sort of the patchwork on the ground because we were quite high up. Contrary to what we believe, memory does not work like a tape recorder. Our memories are not recorded and stored faithfully in the back of our heads and then played back. Like, a, like on a video recorder. Memories aren't permanent. They're, they're a reconstruction, a blend of, of imagination and fantasy and things that you might hear about or think about afterwards and, and also, a, like in our case, a photograph. What kind of implications does this have? One of the implications is that uh, if you remember something and you report it with great confidence, great detail, and it's very vivid and clear, got a lot of emotion, doesn't necessarily mean it really happened. What kind of reaction do you get from people when you tell them this event didn't happen at the end of the week? Uh, surprise, especially if they believe the event happened. Uh, they're also quite scared. Because people, they have a lot of faith in their memories. They think as, a child, um, as an adult they can remember their childhood quite clearly. And it's a big wake-up call when suddenly they realise their memory's not that reliable. One of the four photos we discussed didn't actually occur. So one of them didn't happen. You know which one that is? Um, the blue one. Yep, <laughs> the blue one. Yeah. Well, it's scary, really. Um, a hot air balloon ride is not something you'd easily forget. Okay, so the other thing I like about this video, um, too, is you actually get to view uh, a little bit of a debriefing. So you'll recall in the first video today, uh, Elizabeth um, Loftus, she talked about it not being ethical for um, uh, like therapists to implant memories. And she also talked about the, um, the IRB, right, which is the review board that re reviews experiments to make sure that they're ethical um, and that her uh, uh, experiments were, um, were deemed ethical and, and worth um, the deception that was being used um, 
to conduct the experiment. And if you'll recall, whenever an experiment is being conducted in which deception is used, one of the things that's required is you have to debrief the subjects, right? You have to explain what the, what the deception was. And you kind of got a little bit of a, uh, of a brief part of that um, in the end where um, they were talking about which one was actually the false memory that had been implanted. So um, let's see. So uh, does anybody have any questions or um, any thoughts about the two videos that we've watched so far regarding um, false memories and how memories can be contaminated and uh, any thoughts on that? I was just wondering if the patients that had been in the repressed memory therapy hmm. and had the in the memories implanted that they had been in like really traumatic events like the ones where they had been like victims of demonic possession and that kind of stuff were they ever be able to like get therapy to cor correct the implanted memory or do they just live like believing that that happened? You know, that that's a great question. And I don't have specifics on the um, on those uh, cases. One of the things that I'm thinking of when um, one of the cases was the, uh, oh man, it was in, I think it was in Los Angeles too, um, where the, this whole family was being accused of uh, ritual sexual abuse um, and what ended up happening with them yes. yeah I'm sure some of you guys will remember that um, yeah I lived on three years I think so yeah yeah um, but is there therapy and help yes th there is um, now whether you know these certain individuals that have been discussed um, received that I have to assume that they did just simply because you know like Elizabeth Lofton was talking about some of them um, and, uh, and, and the case in Los Angeles was so famous, it was on the news. And, um, and this is where a lot of this controversy has come from as well, right? Uh, and it makes it, it makes it difficult because the person probably will actually believe it. They're not gonna, you know, they're not making it up. They, it's, it's just, yes, the McMartin case. Thank you. Could not remember the name. Um, but yeah, the McMartin case is what I was referring to. But anyway, but getting back to that, um, I don't know the specifics of that. Uh, Professor, what about with the people who have like a double personality? How do they judge their memories in that case? Yeah, so now that's that's a little bit different because now you're talking about, um, uh, uh, <coughs> you know, psychological disorders that, that impact memory. Um, you have individuals that, um, uh, you know, they hear voices, right? They respond to internal stimuli. And to them, that is all real. Um, that, that's different. The, what we're talking about for this chapter is your average run-of-the-mill human being that's not experiencing any significant mental health concerns. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. All right, another question's coming up. Um, yeah, so it was... Uh, um, the McMartin, they owned a daycare center. That's correct. All right. Um, good discussion there. So let's uh, move into the next thing. We kind of touched on flashbulb memory earlier, right? And so flashbulb memory is um, when we remember something that is unusual and, and, and brings on very strong emotional associations, right? And so for most of us right now, um, this picture here of, of the Twin Towers attack is, is a great example of, of that, right? Most people can remember where they were when they first heard the news. Um, you know, when, uh, you know, I've been, well, I've been alive longer than some, some people here. Um, I, I can remember my parents talking about remembering where they were when they heard that Kennedy was assassinated. I remember where I was when um, and what I was doing and the images when, when the Challenger exploded, right? 
Um, so that's an example of flashbulb memory. These things that just get seared into our, our consciousness. All right. All right, so some, oh, it feels like I skipped a slide. No, I didn't. I thought there was a slide in between that. Okay, so when it comes to memory, obviously there are times when individuals have trouble with memory, right? And amnesia is the loss of long-term memory that um, occurs as the result of disease, uh, some kind of physical trauma, um, or psychological trauma can also um, impact memory, um, creating amnesia. And so there's two types of amnesia, uh, and you will need to know both of these and kind of be able to uh, distinguish between the two, right? So the first one is anterograde amnesia, and that's the inability to remember any new information past the point of the trauma. So for example, HM, when his, um, <coughs> when, um, when his um, temporal lobes were removed, right? Um, and part of his hippocampus was removed, he was not able to form any new memories, to hold on to any new uh, information. So he was experiencing anterograde amnesia. When we're talking about retrograde amnesia, this is memory loss and it can be partial or it can be complete for events that occurred prior to the trauma. And it's usually retrograde amnesia that you see like in the movies, um, things like that where a person can't remember who they are, where they came from, that kind of stuff, right? Um, uh, that would be retrograde amnesia. Um, so anything from the past. So the event here, uh, let me turn on my laser pointer. So the event would be whatever uh, occurred to cause it. So disease, um, a head injury, right? Um, or some kind of psychological trauma. The event is either causing, um, the for, uh, preventing the formation of new memories or has caused the uh, removal or the memory loss of past events. Elizabeth Lofton talked about this as well. Um, and I talked about it in the beginning. I kind of um, brought it up because I wanted to highlight that she was talking about it. And that was um, construction and reconstruction. So construction is um, simply the formation of new memories and reconstruction is the process of bringing up old memories. And when we retrieve old memories, um, we tend to unintentionally alter or modify them. And of course, this results in inaccuracies and, and distortions. So um, it can, you know, like I said earlier, memory can be contaminated by other information, the environment, uh, uh, emotions, whatever, right? So, um, and this is the risk when we are retrieving information. And then there's also the idea of suggestibility, right? And this is where the effects of misinformation from external sources, uh, things outside of ourselves, whether it be social media, news, um, somebody else, uh, uh, talking about the same memory, right? Um, those kinds of things that can lead to the creation of false memories. Uh, and we just saw that actually with the experiment in, um, in Wellington, New Zealand, right? So it caused people to remember that they uh, took a balloon ride. Of course, that was a pretty intense thing. There's a picture there, right? And so, um, 50% uh, of the people believed the picture, even though they had no memory. The other thing about um, suggestibility is, that we have to realize is that memories are fragile um, and they are vulnerable to the power of suggestion. Um, Elizabeth Loftus talked about this and, um, and we just saw that in the Wellington video as well. 
And then another important study that has, uh, that's been conducted and there's been, and I'm about to show another video, actually two videos, two consecutive, they're parts one and two. Um, it talks about the role of suggestibility in eyewitness testimony, in, um, in identification of uh, possible uh, suspects in crimes, um, things like that. So let's see, I think it's the very next slide. Oh, no, I forgot I had this one. Um, so this, this is leading into that video. So witness identification and, um, I'm sorry, eyewitness identification and testimony is very often used in the prosecution of criminals. And what's interesting here is, is you know, eyewitness testimony is the cornerstone uh, in many ways of our justice system. And so some of this may be kind of scary for you guys now that we're, we're, we're talking about this, how easily memories can be, um, can be altered. Now that's not to say that every uh, eyewitness testimony is wrong. Um, but there's also uh, procedures, police procedures, investigatory procedures, interviewing procedures that can also affect um, an eyewitness testimony. And one thing I want to stress is that I really believe that for the most part, most people involved in this, there's nothing malicious happening. Right, so the contamination is occurring accidentally. The contamination is occurring um, through uh, poor procedures that need improvement to pre to prevent that. And we're going to talk about that um, uh, in after these videos. So this is from um, sixty minutes. Uh, I forget exactly how old it is. I've been I've been using this video for a very long time. Um, I actually, I'll, I'll be honest, watching, even though I've watched this over and over and over again, there are parts of it that still kind of um, uh, make me a little bit emotional, simply because of what happened, and then also what they did in the aftermath. So it's kind of like, you kind of get, a, or at least I do, get a little emotional in a sad way, but then I also get a, a little emotional in a in a happy way, because based on this case, you'll see you'll see that different um, improvements in police procedures um, were discovered. So, so we'll go ahead and watch. Uh, this is part one, and when it's done, uh, we'll go to the next video and do part two. And then remember, this may also get cut out of the lecture portion, but is this is available on canvas in case it is cut. So here we go. It's a cliche of courtroom dramas. That moment when the eyewitness is asked, do you see the person who committed the crime here in this courtroom before you? Well, it happens in real courtrooms all the time. And to jurors, that point of the finger by a confident witness is about as damning as evidence can get. But there is one type of evidence that's even more persuasive, and that, of course, is DNA. There have been 233 people exonerated by DNA in this country, and now a stunning pattern has emerged. More than three quarters of them were sent to prison, at least in part, because an eyewitness pointed a finger, an eyewitness who we now know was wrong. It was hot and humid in Burlington, North Carolina on the night of July 28, 1984. Jennifer Thompson, then a 22-year-old college student, had gone to bed early in her off-campus apartment. As she slept, a man shattered the light bulb near her back door, cut her phone line, and broke in. I remember kind of waking up and turning my head to the side and saying, who's there, who is it? And I saw the top of someone's head kind of sliding beside my mattress. And I screamed and I felt a blade go to my throat. A, a knife? A knife. And he told me to shut up or he was gonna 
kill me. Her first thought was to offer him anything she had to go away. You can have my credit card, you can have my wallet, you can have anything in the apartment, you can have my car. And he looked at me and said, I don't want your money. And I knew mm. what was getting ready to happen. She vowed to stay alert and study him so that if she lived, she could help put him away forever. What is his voice? Does he have an accent? Does he have a scar? Is there a tattoo? He's raping you and you're studying his face. I mean, it was just trying to pay attention to a detail that if I survived, and that was my plan, um, I'd be able to help the police catch him. After about half an hour, Jennifer tricked the rapist into letting her get up and fix him a drink, and she ran out the back door. He fled and raped a second woman half a mile away. Detective Mike Galden met Jennifer at the hospital. The first comment I remember her making was that, I'm gonna get this guy that did this to me. She said, I took mm -hmm. the time to look at him. I will be able to identify him if I'm given an opportunity. Detective Galden worked with Jennifer to make a composite sketch, poring over eyes, noses, ears, lips, trying to recreate the face she had seen that night. The sketch went out and tips started coming in. One of those tips was about a young man named Ronald Cotton, who worked at a restaurant near the scene of both rapes and had a record, a guilty plea to breaking and entering, and as a teenager, to sexual assault. Three days after the rape, Mike Alden called Jennifer in to do a photo lineup. He lay these six pictures down on the table, said the perpetrator may or may not be one of them, and told her to take her time. Does she say immediately, that's him? No, she studied each photograph. I can remember almost feeling like I was at an SAT test. You know, yeah. we start narrowing down your choices. You can discount A and B and- Oh, like multiple choice. Exactly. According to the police report, Jennifer studied the pictures for five minutes. She picked up Ron's photograph and said, that's the man who raped me. And you must have said, are you sure? And she said, yes? Yeah. Oh, yes, certainly. Ronald Cotton heard the news from his mother's boyfriend. He told me, he said, Ron, he said, the police are looking for you. And I said, for what? He told me, for rape, I said, I can commit such a crime like that. Did you panic? I didn't panic. I was trying to figure out, you know, why. He comes in and gives me a very detailed uh, account of where he was, who he was with that night. As it turns out, uh, that was a false alibi. I realized later that I had got my weekends confused, and so therefore, I gave them the reason to think that I was lying. This was August 1st, 1984. Right. You go in to clear yourself. When did you actually leave? I didn't. He was locked up, and days later, put in a physical lineup. I'm number five. You scared? I was very scared, nervous. I was so nervous. I was trembling, you know, I felt my body just shaking. They were asked to step forward, speak, and step back. I can remember looking to the detective and saying, it's between four and five, can I have them do it again? And then she knew it was number five, Ronald Cotton. Did you feel absolutely certain? Absolutely certain. Did anybody say to you, good job? Well, what was said to me afterwards was, that's the same person you picked out in the photo lineup. So in my mind, I thought, bingo. I did it right. I did it right. In a week-long trial, the jury heard about Ronald Cotton's faulty alibi, his clothing that matched Jennifer's description, and a piece of foam found on her floor that seemed to come from one of his shoes. And most powerfully, they heard from Jennifer. When they ask you, do you recognize the man who did this to you? Did you point to him? It was oh, Ronald Cotton. It was Ronald Cotton. She called my name, pointing her finger, and that's all, that's all it takes, it seemed like. What did that feel like? It felt like someone pushing a knife through me. It took the jury just 40 minutes. The verdict, guilty on all counts. And he was sentenced to life in 50 years, and it was for me that moment that you know the justice system works, because I am the victim, and he's a horrible person, and he will never, ever be free again. Ronald Cotton was handcuffed, shackled, and taken to North Carolina's Central Prison. He was 22 years old. 
you know, they say grown men nothing cry, but it's a lie, you know. I grabbed my pillow many times and hugged it, wishing I was hugging my mom, my dad, sister, brother. I wish it didn't have to be this way. He started working in the prison kitchen, singing in the choir, and writing letter after letter to his attorneys, hoping to get a new trial. Then one day, as he watched a new inmate being brought in, he had a strange feeling. I said, excuse me, I said, uh, I said, you look familiar. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Burlington. I said, I am too. I said, you kind of resemble the drawing of a suspect in a crime in which I'm falsely in prison. Well, did you commit this crime? And he told me, no, he did not. Wait a sec, you saw him and thought of that composite Picture. drawing? Mm -hmm. His name was Bobby Poole, and he was in for rape. He started working in the prison kitchen too. And the stewardess were calling me Poole instead of Cotton. They were calling you by his name? Yes. Pe in other words, people were mistaking the two of you? Yes, exactly. Then a fellow inmate told him that he'd heard Bobby Poole admit to raping Jennifer and the other woman that night. Ronald Cotton won a new trial, and his lawyers called Bobby Poole to the stand with Jennifer sitting right there. It was the moment Ronald Cotton had been hoping for. Bobby Poole is in the courtroom. You look over there. What happens inside you? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. As a matter of fact, the strongest emotion I felt was anger at the defense. Because I thought, how dare you? How dare you question me? How dare you try to paint me as someone who could possibly have forgotten what my rapist looked like? I mean, the one person you would never forget? How I'm dare gonna... you? Ronald Cotton was convicted again, this time given two life sentences. Back in prison, seven years later, he and everyone else was riveted by a big news story, the trial of O.J. Simpson. I would get my radio, put my earplugs, and go outside, sit in a corner. And listen to the trial. Yes. He was intrigued by something he had never heard of, DNA. He wrote to his new attorney, law professor Rich Rosen. Rosen warned him that there probably wasn't any evidence left to test, and if there was, DNA could cut both ways. Understand, if the DNA comes back and shows that you did this crime, whatever legal issues we have don't make any bit of difference. You're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. He warned you mm -hmm. that if it comes up positive, you're sunk. All right, tell him to put his foot down and go with it. Packed away on the shelves of the Burlington Police Department was 10-year-old evidence from the two rapes that night. Inside one of the rape kits was a fragment of a single sperm with viable DNA. It proved what Ronald Cotton had been saying all along. He was innocent, and the rapist was Bobby Poole. <laughs> Within days, Ronald Cotton was back in court. You are walking out here today as free man. Yes. This time, to be released. So not only do you find out that Ron didn't do the crime, you find out Bobby Poole did. It was just utter shock, really, disbelief. I mean, uh, by this time, this is 11 years later. And, you know, I know that uh, I've been involved in a case that a man's lost 11 years of his life. And uh, I just, I was so sad for him and his family. In the years since Ronald Cotton's conviction, Jennifer had married and had children. Are you the one that tells her? Yes. Her reaction was, no, that can't be true. It's not possible, you know. Mm -hmm. I know Ronald Cotton raped me. There's no question in my mind. It was like someone had just taken my life and, like, turned it upside down. She cried? Oh, she cried. She broke down. I mean, she took it all on herself. You know, the guilt. You know, I did this to that, man. Shame? Shame. Terrible shame. A suffocating, debilitating shame. But when she thought or dreamed about that night, it was still Ronald Cotton's face she saw. To get past it, she asked if he would meet with her at a local church. I remember him walking into the church, and I physically could not stand up. She was nervous, scared. I started to cry immediately. And I looked at him and I said, Ron, if I spent every second of every minute, every hour for the rest of my life telling you how sorry I am, it wouldn't come close to how my heart feels. 
I'm so sorry. And Ronald just leaned down, he took my hands. Oh gosh. And he looked at me, he said, I forgive you. I told her, I said, Jennifer, I forgive you. I don't want you to look over your shoulder. That I just want us to be happy and move on in life. The minute he forgave me, it's like my heart physically started to heal. And I thought, this is what grace and mercy is all about. This is what they teach you in church that none of us ever get. And here was this man that I had hated with, I mean, I used to pray every day of my life during those 11 years that he would die, mm. that he would be raped in prison mm. and someone would kill him in prison. That was my prayer to God. And here was this man who with grace and mercy just forgave me. That is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Yeah. How wrong I was and how good he is. How is it that Jennifer could have studied her rapist so carefully and still made this mistake? And how could she have failed to recognize Bobby Poole, the actual rapist, when he sat right in front of her in the courtroom three years later? That part of the story when we come back. So those are some good questions. Um, so first of all, just from what we've talked about in lecture tonight regarding um, how memories form or uh, thinking about, just think about what Jennifer was doing and how would you describe what she was doing while she was being raped? Uh, you could type it in the chat or, um, uh, or just shout it out. There's a particular term I'm actually looking for that we talked about earlier. Was she like rehearsing what he looked like, like going over it and like rehearsing his features? That's a very, yes, very good. So she's, she's doing some rehearsal. Um, she's doing, what else, what else was she doing? Remember the, think of, uh, oh, a chat came in. Maybe we have a, uh, let's see. Uh, no, that would not be, Correct. So the answer was um, anterograde. Um, no, that's a type of amnesia that occurs as a result of a significant event, disease, injury, right, where she couldn't remember anything forward. Um, no, what? she was going emotional. Ahead. I was going to say emotional conditioning, maybe of her uh, implicit memory. I'm not sure. Yeah. So there's some. No, you you're going on the right track, right? So there was some, definitely some strong emotional. Um, things from there. Um, another answer is coming in that, yeah, it was in short-term memory. She's doing rehearsal. Um, but what I really want you guys to think about is she was really engaged in which kind effortful of- Effortful encoding. Yes, effort, effortful processing. That's exactly correct. That's, that's, that's what it was. Um, because she was, she was like, I, I am going to, what's his voice? What is, uh, does he have an accent, right? She, um, she's looking at his features, right? She's really making an effort to, to remember this guy, right? Um, and even with all of that, the memory was contaminated. And that's something to, to think of. So good job with the discussion. Um, let's go to the... Next slide and watch part two. It's a cliche of course. Oops, next one. So here is part two. And you'll recognize this woman. This is um, Elizabeth Loftus, who we just watched earlier. Now that DNA has exonerated more than 230 men, mostly in sex crimes and murder cases, Criminologists have been able to go back and study what went wrong in those investigations. What they've honed in on is faulty eyewitness testimony. Over 75% of these innocent men were convicted in part because an eyewitness fingered the wrong person. At the heart of the problem is the fragility of memory. As one researcher told us, we now know that memory is not like a videotape recorder. 
you don't just record an event and play it back. Instead, memory is malleable, full of holes, easily contaminated and susceptible to suggestion, as in the case of Jennifer Thompson and Ronald Cotton. Before this case, did you think that there were a lot of innocent people put away? No. You didn't? No, I didn't. Innocent people aren't convicted of crimes they didn't commit. I, I believe that. What do you think now? Oh, I know better. I mean, well over 200 cases nationally. We've had a half a dozen in this state alone. The first, of course, was my case. Hallelujah! And as these innocent men have been freed in one state after the next, we've learned something else, that in all the cases where eyewitnesses were wrong, the real perpetrator was not in the initial lineup. When you're sitting in front of a photo lineup, you just assume one of these guys is the suspect. It's my job to find it. And Jennifer did her job. She found the suspect's photo. Problem is, the suspect, Ronald Cotton, was not the rapist. Bobby Poole's photograph was not in the photo lineup. Right. He was not in the physical lineup. When the real perpetrator is not in the set, is, is none of them, uh, witnesses have a very difficult time being able to recognize that. Gary Wells, a professor of psychology at Iowa State University, has been studying eyewitness memory for 30 years. He says when the real guy isn't there, witnesses tend to pick the person who looks most like him. I think that Ronald Cotton and Bobby Poole look very much alike. They have very similar lips shape of their eyes, their eyebrows kind of go up in a look of surprise. Yes. yes. Without him in the lineup, Ronald Cotton was the one who was in jeopardy. Well says eyewitness testimony has two key properties. One, it's often unreliable, and two, it is highly persuasive to jurors. I can see why it's so persuasive. Someone says, I was there. You'd believe that person. You believe that person because they have no reason to lie. Yeah. The legal system is set up to kind of sort between liars and truth tellers, and, and it's actually pretty good at that. But when someone is genuinely mistaken, the legal system doesn't really know uh, how to deal with that, and we're talking about a genuine error here. He walked us through what went wrong, some of it counterintuitive. When Jennifer spent five minutes studying the photographs, she and Detective Galden thought she was being careful. I didn't want to come across, I don't think, as somebody who was like, that's the one. I really wanted to be sure. Well says no good. Recognition memory is actually uh, quite rapid. So we find in our studies, for example, that if somebody's taking longer than 10, 15 seconds, it's quite likely that they're doing something other than just using uh, a reliable recognition memory. So you're saying if she really recognized a guy, it would have been almost instantaneous? Quite quick, yes. He says a better way would have been to show Jennifer lineup photos or people one at a time so that she would compare each one directly to her memory rather than to one another. Well, Wells showed me a study in which more than 300 happened. subjects were shown deliberately uh, shaky uh, videotape of a simulated crime. You look out a window and you see some suspicious behavior. What happens is we tell them later then this person that you saw right there mm -hmm. put a bomb down, that, uh, down the air shaft there. Then subjects are shown a lineup and asked to identify the bomber. That would be so hard. And Very I difficult. just saw it. And uh, of course, you're particularly cautious right now. You know now, after we've talked, probably not to pick anyone. <laughs> no, no, actually. I, know, I actually know who it is because yeah. if I had yeah. who is come it? upon that, I think it's this guy. Am I wrong? Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? Yeah. I'm, I'm wrong. wrong? Yeah. Okay, so there you go. And I'm already saying how hard it is. It's none of them. It's none and of it's them. And it's so. It, it, it's so <gasps> And you Isn't know about that bizarre? it. bizarre? You know about this. We've talked about this. So, <gasps> so this is the difficult. This Isn't is what that, makes it so difficult. Look what you just did to me. Yeah. I'm mortified. I feel like Jennifer. Well says in real life, the mistake is often compounded by what happens next. Remember the seemingly innocent information Jennifer says she got from police after she picked Ronald Cotton out of the physical lineup? That's the same person you picked out in the photo lineup. So in my mind, I thought, bingo, I did it right. Well studied what that reinforcement does. After half his subjects did what I did, picked an innocent person from this lineup, 
he told them nothing, then asked them questions about what they had seen. Very few felt highly confident about their choice. Only about 4% are saying they had a great view, which is good because we gave them a lousy view. Only about 3% are saying they make out details of the face. That also is good because they, they really couldn't. But he told a second group of subjects, after they made the same incorrect choices, good, you pick the suspect. Now what happens is oh uh, 40, uh, almost 45% of witnesses now report that they were positive or nearly positive. Notice that over one-fourth of them now say they had a great view. And <laughs> this is really what happened to Jennifer. It is what happened yeah. with Jennifer. What this seems to be saying is that a reinforcement alters memory. It does. Dramatically. It does. He says the solution is to have someone independent administer the lineup, someone who doesn't even know who the suspect is, and certainly not the detective on the case. You I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have been there. Yeah. But nobody did anything wrong. I mean, that well, was no, the Well, no, that practice. was the common practice yeah. then. It was, it was the tradition. It was how it was done then. Law enforcement wasn't schooled in memory. We weren't schooled in protecting memory, treating it like a crime scene, where you're very careful, methodical about what you do and how you use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we weren't, we weren't taught that in those days. But none of these errors explains perhaps the most puzzling part of this story, how it is that Jennifer could see Bobby Poole in the courtroom and not realize her mistake. You're looking into the face of the man who raped you, whose face you had studied so intently, yes. and there's no flicker, no. nothing between you and, and Bobby Poole. Nothing. Nothing. And I've gone back there many times trying to think, was there? Was there ever a moment? Did I ever look at him and think, <gasps> and I didn't. Elizabeth Loftus is a professor of psychology and law at the University of California, Irvine, and an expert in memory. She showed me an experiment she says might help explain Jennifer's mistake. She asked me to study these faces. Then, after a few minutes, she gave me a memory test. Which of these two faces do you recognize? Right. OK, you picked right. Left. You picked left. OK. And I said left, but I wasn't 100% sure. And then the tricky part. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why I'm stymied. Because I just picked this one on the left two seconds ago. But now I'm not sure, because those two look very much alike to me. But I'm going to tell you the left. But I was wrong. It was the one on the right. Loftus explained how I had been duped. You saw this face. Then I gave you a test where I presented you with an oh. altered face, oh my God. along with a novel one. So I pretty much induce you to pick a wrong face oh. because I don't even have the real guy there. It's an altered version. And later on, when you now have a choice between the altered one and the real one, you stuck with your altered left yeah. choice. This is exactly what happened to Jennifer. This can help us understand why Jennifer can be sitting in a courtroom mm -hmm. and be looking at Bobby Poole, the original rapist, and looking at Ronald Cotton and saying, saying, no, it's not Poole, it's Cotton, because she has been picking him yeah. all along. I begin to wonder whether there should ever be eyewitness <laughs> testimony in uh, trials well, because of the tricks that memory plays. Yeah. I, I think what's important, though, is, is to understand that, know that. Know it as a police officer, as an investigator, uh, as, as attorneys. We need eyewitnesses. I mean, if we couldn't convict based on um, an eyewitness, that's giving a lot of comfort to criminals. We have no choice. We have to find ways to make this evidence uh, better. And that's something Jennifer has tried to do ever since, by telling her story to prosecutors, police, defense attorneys. And she's had some success. Her state, North Carolina, was the first in the country to mandate reforms by law, showing victims lineup photos one at a time and emphasizing that the right answer may be none of the above. Having lineups conducted by a person who doesn't know who the suspect is, or not by a person at all. 
The person who committed the crime may or may not be included. One system now used in a handful of cities is computer software Mike Golden helped develop to have a laptop conduct photo lineups. Does this person look familiar to you? But yeah. law professor Rich Rosen says that in the vast majority of places, there's been no reform, and that needs to change. This is something that police officers can and should be in favor of. Because you're, you're not getting the real guy off the street. Yeah. Bobby Poole raped other women because they went after Ron Cotton. So Ron is not the only person who suffered from this mistake. Ronald Cotton, now 47 years old, has worked hard to rebuild his life. He works the late shift in a factory. He's been married for 12 years and has a 10-year-old daughter. They live in a house paid for with money I mean, North look, Carolina paid him in restitution, $10,000 for each of the 11 look, years he spent look. in prison. When he can, he joins Jennifer in her campaign for reforms. One of the most amazing things to have come out of this miscarriage of justice is the most unlikely of friendships. Jennifer and Ron say they speak on the phone about once a week. They're families of friends. They say they have a shared bond that is hard for most people to fathom. Have people ever met you for the first time when you're together and said kind of cheerily, hey, how did you two meet? Yeah. yeah. They we had did it on the airplane a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're traveling. And I usually just go, you tell them. <laughs> well, what you do know. you say? We would look at each other and laugh, you know, and finally we go ahead and... And tell them. Mm -hmm. And they have recently co-authored a book in hopes that their story can inform and inspire others. Today, when you think about what happened to you that night when you were 22 years old, whose face is there? Nobody's. Oh my, that's, that's, that to me is one of the most beautiful things is I don't have a face. Hmm. Bobby Poole's dead. I don't ever have to worry about him ever hurt another woman. He died in prison and Ronald Cotton is my friend. For more on how memories can be contaminated, go to 60minutes.com. All right, so um, let's see. One of, the, uh, one of the chats that came in during the video was, um, uh, states this, could you imagine reinforcement by corrupt detectives? Yikes. Um, and yes, that, that, is, that is true. Um, you know, and here's the, here's the thing. Um, I, I, again, this is just, you know, my belief. I think that most law enforcement, you know, really are there to try to do a good job. Um, but you're right. The corrupt the corrupt individuals who just want to make the case, um, like today in the news, you know, the deputy that was sentenced to prison for planting drugs on people. There are, there is that happening, you know, in the world. That is, that really is the uh, uh, the truth of the matter. Um, but I think the awesome thing that again com comes out of this whole thing, uh, and and they talk about it and share about it in the book Picking Cotton. Um, is, is the laws that were enacted specifically in North Carolina that they talked about, you know, to really try to preserve memory um, as, as the one detective said, treat it like a crime scene, do things that preserve it in a way that make it safer so that it doesn't get corrupted. Um, because yes, our memories are, are, are fallible, but that doesn't mean that everything gets corrupted. Does, I hope that makes sense, right? There are ways to, uh, to preserve eyewitness testimony, uh, which is pretty awesome. Any other thoughts or comments on, on this video? I, again, I found it pretty powerful. Not, not sure if you guys did or not, but uh, I hope so. All right. Um, so the misinformation effect, actually, we've been talking about that a lot throughout this entire, um, uh, you know, the last half of this lecture, really, um, how memories can be uh, contaminated. 
And this is from the study that, that Elizabeth discussed in the opening video. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, you'll see that the, the points that I make here are, are the very same ones that she discussed when um, talking about her experiment. And, and again, with corruption of memory, leading questions and different terminology can lead people to, um, to have their memories altered based on, on um, words that are used, right? And then here is another example from the Loftus study. This is also in the book, right? Um, the different words that were used, right? Smashed versus collided versus um, bumped versus hit and versus contacted, right? So those, those, those different words, right? Um, obviously had an impact on uh, the perceived speed of the vehicle, right? So you use the word like smashed, that sounds like, oh, they were going pretty fast. Use the word contacted, <laughs> um, that doesn't sound like it was going as fast, right? So. And she also talked about repressed um, and recovered memories. Um, and this is a very uh, controversial topic. Um, and Elizabeth in her um, TED Talk video earlier uh, discussed all of this um, very well. Um, so there's the idea that of false memory syndrome, right? Which is the re the recall of false autobiographical um, biographical memories. And, um, you know, when it comes to this, uh, repressed memory, some psychologists um, believe it is possible to completely repress traumatic childhood memories, such as sexual abuse. Um, uh, that, that can happen, right? And can lead to uh, psychological distress in, in um, uh, adulthood. Some believe that these can be recalled through hypnosis and guided imagery. And this is where the controversy comes in, right? Um, and what's unfortunate is that uh, if you recall from uh, the amnesia slide where we had the two different types of amnesia, right? Uh, retrograde, in other words, you can't remember the past. Um, anterograde, where you can't remember the future. Um, there, three things that I talked about that could cause that, right? Three events, um, right? So there's disease where the brain is diseased or damaged in some way, or there is traumatic brain injury um, that causes you know, physical damage to the brain as well, or uh, some psychological um, uh, event, right? Where um, the event is so horrific that psychologically the person uh, may experience uh, retrograde amnesia of the event, right? Or what they would call repressed, repressed memories. Um, the issue here that I think I'm putting on my laser pointer that has been really stressed is the hypnosis and guided imagery techniques can use a lot of suggestive type of language and words. And so I think that's where the um, uh, controversy comes in. And she really challenges the idea of repressed memories and questions if recalled memories are accurate or whether the processes of questioning and uh, suggestibility leads to that misinformation effect, right? Um, So, and sorry, I just stopped because I was just thinking about, you know, how sad that is for victims who may have experienced it that may never, you know, get treatment for that or those that never experienced it, but because of suggestibility and the misinformation effect um, causes them psychological trauma plus whoever else is involved. This is why the science of psychology is so important. We need study this stuff and have more information. All right, so I'm gonna do a little memory test real quick. Um, 
So there are four nickels I'm gonna show you. Boom, 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 right? So I want you to think about it. Do not reach into your pocket and pull out a nickel. So is nickel A the accurate depiction of a US nickel? Is nickel B an accurate depiction of a nickel? Is nickel C or nickel D? And before anybody answers, we don't have any uh, coin collectors in here, do we? <laughs> you guys will probably know if you're a new numismatist. Let's see what we got here. So I have one answer. Um, I have two, three answers. All right, very good. I have four answers. Oh, you're just gonna take a ball. I have five answers. Six. Ah. Very good. All right. Well, I think that's good. So if you answered. C, this one, you would be correct. Now, let's talk about why this might have been difficult. Some people thought it was none. Some people thought it was, oops, I'm sorry. Some people thought it was, uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Hold on, I'm messing me up. All right. So why do we forget things? And why is it that this might've been difficult for some? Some of you might've looked at it and go, I don't know which one. They all look like nickels to me, right? Um, this would be an example of encoding failure, right? Um, and, this, and the reason for encoding failure is the memory is never really stored in the first place. Like who cares which one is the, is the real nickel? as long as what I pull out of my pocket gets accepted at the store. So in other words, there's no, there's no automatic processing there. There's no, not even any effortful processing, right? There's no enco uh, encoding that happens because most, most Americans can't tell which one it is because we don't, we just don't know, we just don't need to know that difference. We know enough to know the difference between a nickel and a dime a penny and a quarter, right? So uh, that's a good example of, if you didn't know, it's probably because you really haven't encoded it. And it's, you know. Um, okay. So that was fun. All right, let's see. Um, got some other thing. <laughs> yes, and so from a design perspective, that one made the most sense but I haven't actually uh, looked at a nickel in years. And this is one of your fellow students who typed that into the chat. And that's exactly what I was saying, right? We, we don't really pay attention to that. Um, yes, yep, 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 very good. And some agreement on, on, uh, on the first student's comment about design perspective making sense. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about some other thing, memory errors. And there's um, Schachter's seven sins of memory, right? So there's the forgetting type um, and then the distortion type. So these are the two types of, of uh, memory errors according to Schachter, right? So first there's transients and that is the accessibility of the memory decreases over time. I'll give you a perfect example. Everything we're doing tonight, and this has been you know, a long lecture, actually all my lectures are long, I apologize for that. Um, but the most you're going to remember without any other trying to study it is gonna be tonight. Because 24 hours from now, 70% of what we've talked about tonight, you will have lost. Um, it, just, it just goes away over time. This is why studying is, important and that's why re uh, rehearsal might be important um, reading or rereading or reviewing the the lecture again if that's what you need to do right 
because just realize you're losing stuff along the way. Then there's absent-mindedness, right? Forgetting uh, that's caused by lapses in attention, um, uh, which is really interesting. How many times, uh, well, I'll just use me as an example, right? So actually, I think I used this the other day. So pardon me if I have, but like on my key fob for my car, you know, I can lock it with the push of a button. But when I'm getting out of my car and I'm on my way into my office or something, my mind is not on what I'm doing at that moment. I'm, what am I going to do when I get in the office? What's going on for the day, right? And I push the button and I'm not even thinking about it. And then I get inside and I ask myself, did I lock my car? And I always do. But I was, I was inattentive to my actual behavior in the moment. And then there's blocking, right? Um, accessibility of information is temporary blocked, uh, also known as the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Um, and embarrassingly so, you guys actually observe me experience blocking more than um, I would care for you to observe. Uh, like when I try to recall a word and it won't come up for me. Um, and I usually blame it on my Wernicke's area and my Broca's area arguing with each other, which is actually kind of a joke because um, it really has nothing to do with that. It's really blocking that's causing my issue. Um, and then there's the distortion type of um, memory errors. So misattribution, so a memory is confused. So you're mixing up one memory with, uh, or one source with another source. Um, suggestibility, we've been talking about a lot about false memories. Biases, right? So that is when our memories get distorted by our current belief system. And then there's the intrusion type, <clears throat> which is the uh, persistence, which is the inability to forget undesirable memories. Um, this happens a lot with like post-traumatic stress, uh, although to a much greater degree, right? Um, so these are the seven sins of memory according to Schachter and his memory errors. And then here's what I was talking about just a moment ago, right? So um, right now, um, the, this is the forgetting curve. And you'll notice that it drops significantly after 20 minutes, right? If we use this, after 20 minutes, um, oops, 30% of what you've learned is lost, right? 24 hours from now, what, did I have that right? Yep, 70% 70, 70 is not retained without, um, uh, without, without you doing some more um, intentional learning to keep it there. So uh, this is, I like to point this out to students um, just because I always recommend that you do a little bit of work every day, right? Uh, and then when it comes to the lectures, right? Taking notes will help um, increase your memory, you know, that kind of stuff, so. All right, so we talked about bias a couple, uh, two slides ago. Um, and according to Schachter, right? Your feelings and views of the world can distort your memory. So there's, um, three types of biases that we're gonna talk about, right? So first is the stereotypical bias. And this involves uh, racial and gender biases. Um, so after presenting people with a list of names, so here's, here's one um, study, right? They more frequently incorrect, um, incorrectly remembered typical African-American names to be associated with the occupation um, uh, basketball player and typical white names to be associated with the occupation of a uh, pop politician. <coughs> so that was one of the studies. And then there's egocentric bias, bias um, which involves enhancing our memories um, of the past, right? So people remember uh, events in a way that makes them look better. 
right? So, because um, nobody wants to look bad, right? We don't want to think of ourselves as bad. So that egocentric bias, we tend to look at ourselves in a more positive light um, than what may have actually happened. Not that we're all bad or anything, but. And then hindsight bias, which is the tendency to think an outcome was an ine inevitable after the fact, as if you were thinking that you knew this, I knew this was gonna happen. I knew it all along. I should have done something different. Um, hindsight bias, I'm sure a lot of us have, um, I know I've experienced that. So it's very common. Um, this is talking about persistence, right? I, I uh, kind of related that to post-traumatic stress a, a, a minute ago. Um, so many military family, um, I'm sorry, many veterans of military conflicts, right? Involuntarily recall unwanted or un pleasant memories, right? Um, and oftentimes we think of the military when it comes to post-traumatic stress. Um, but I recently worked, I did some EMDR work with, uh, with an individual who was involved in a, in a really bad car accident in which, you know, he was driving and his friend was severely injured. And, um, you know, and he experienced post-traumatic stress after that, the memories, um, avoidance of like he hadn't driven in years because he would avoid, um, avoid driving. Um, he would experience freeze if he was behind the wheel. Um, uh, so that would be an example of, of persistence in, in, in those memories. And then um, interference also causes uh, forgetting, right? So, um, and this can happen, there's, there's two different types of interference I want to focus on. And let me put, put on my laser pointer because uh, it's easier to talk and point at the same time so you guys can see. So the first part is proactive interference, right? So the example here is like if learning your combination to your school locker back in the day, right? And you have that in there. Like I have my old phone number from when I was a kid um, and like I can recite that. Uh, that's an example of having that old inter in information that hinders new information, right? So, so having the old locker combination in your head and, and having that memory um, blocks you or interferes from recalling the new locker combination. So that's an example of proactive uh, interference. And then re retroactive interference is um, where you learn your sibling's new email address and the new information hinders the recall of old information, right? So, uh, so the knowledge of the new e email address interferes recall of the old email address, which one may ask if it's an old email address, why would you still want it? Um, because it still may be active as an example, and maybe they want something sent to that one. Just kind of throwing that out there. But that's two good examples of proactive and retroactive interference. So the presence of other information. And there's some good ways to enhance your memory, right? So there's rehearsal, which we have talked about, um, which is the conscious repetition of the information being remembered. And then there's chunking which is you know, um, organizing information into manageable bits or parts, right? Um, so separating phone numbers into three chunks, right? Um, I don't know what Jenny's area code was, but we're just gonna go with 619. Uh-oh, here's an example of blocking. Oh yeah, 619-876, no. You are now experiencing and witnessing your professor experiencing blocking. Um, 8675309, that's what I was trying to say. And throwing the 619 in front of that threw me off, totally threw me off. Uh, but separating phone numbers into three chunks, right? Because remember, how many pieces of information can we generally work with in short term memory? 
Who remembers? Seven. 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 That's exactly it. Seven. Plus or minus two, right? So it could be up to nine for some people and as few as five, but the average is seven. Seven pieces of information. And then there's elaborative rehearsal, which is the technique in which you think about the meaning of the new information and its relation to the knowledge already stored in your memory. And then there's also um, mnemonic devices, right? Memory aids that help us organize um, information uh, for encoding, right? So one way to remember the order of the planets is Mr. Um, uh, Vem J. Sun, right? Um, I actually like the example in the book better remembering the, the, uh, the Great Lakes, right? By using homes, right? So homes, Huron, Ontario, uh, Michigan, um, E is Erie, and S is Superior, right? So that's, that's a, uh, a mnemonic device. Uh, let's see, okay. Oh, this is the last slide for this. And then we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna talk about Sheldon Shaping Penny. Um, so how to study effectively, right? So I encourage people to use elaborative rehearsal, um, apply the self-reference effect, right? Make the information more personally meaningful to you. Um, and don't forget about the forgetting curve. Tomorrow, 70% of your retention from tonight's class is gone. So if you know that already, then hopefully using these other techniques will, will help you remember it more, right? Beware of, inter, um, of interference. So one of the things that I always suggest people do, the way you are gonna take your exam should be the way you study. So ordinarily, like when I'm meeting, um, when we're on campus um, and we're taking exams in person, my classroom is quiet um, and, you know, I, I, I make sure the atmosphere is such that people can uh, take the exam without being disturbed. So if you know you're gonna take an exam in a quiet type of thing, then when you're studying, it's probably a good idea to have the same similar type of environment, you know, quietness and things like that. Um, just using that as an example. Um, keep moving, right? Aerobic exercise promotes neurogenesis in your brain. So remember, we were talking about neuroplasticity. Used to be that we thought that the neurons you had when you were born was all you would have for the rest of your life. And if they were damaged, oh well, you, know, you just missed out on that. But that actually has turned out to not be true, that, that neurogenesis still does occur. Make sure you get enough sleep, um, use your mnemonic devices, and do not cram. Do not cram before the exam. You actually, studies show that people actually do worse on exams when that happens. So I always advise against that. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes um, chapter eight. Uh, like I said, um, we still have a little bit of class left and we're gonna do a discussion on Sheldon Shaping Penny. I'm gonna stop this recording now and uh, say good night to chapter eight.